So first of all, take accountability of the problem. Make sure that you go and apologize to all the people. And then you, whenever you go to any problems, my first motto is don't bring a problem to someone, bring a solution with it. So I always rack my brain with five different solutions. Okay, what can I do to handle it? Is repacking a good idea? Is it too much money? Can I do something with the lot? Can we sell it at number two? Is there something that I can do? Is, there are so many things that can be done. Welcome to episode 17 of the Food Grads podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a molecular science graduate student and career partner with Food Grads. On this week's podcast, I interviewed Fatima Basawala, a quality assurance and HACCP specialist at Toppets Foods. Toppets Foods is an importer and supplier of frozen foods to the Canadian food service, retail, and manufacturing industries specializing in seafood. In this episode, Fatima and I talked about her career journey in Canada, starting with her time at Centennial College in their biotechnology and food science co-op program. Throughout her career, through her co-ops and full-time jobs, she has worked at the CFIA, Safina Foods, WG Pro Manufacturing, and now Toppets. And not to mention, she's been helping out food grads as a campus ambassador during her time, and I had the pleasure of hanging out and working alongside her during that time, and it's really exciting to see how she's grown into this amazing quality assurance technician in the industry after graduating. Overall, Fatima gives some great insights as to what it's like working in quality assurance and how she approaches problems when they arise in the plant. I got to learn about food safety and quality standards in the food industry context. You can tell that Fatima has a great enthusiasm and drive to learn about the food industry, and one of the messages that you'll hear that resonates throughout this episode is that you have to have a problem solver's mindset. If you find a problem, take accountability for it, it's okay that it happened, but bring solutions to the problem when you see them. So let's just jump into it, onto the show. I'm excited to have you on the show, Fatima, because you are one of the people that I've worked with in the past for food grads, and you were one of our campus ambassadors. So it's really exciting to see you go from a student at Centennial College to now working full time in QA. So I'm really excited to bring you onto the show. This is going to be good. Yeah, definitely. I was so excited about it. I honestly started my career with food grads. So the first ever food grads before pre-COVID used to take students on fair events. And one of the events I hit with you guys, I actually met one of the CEOs of the company in that food events. And he was, oh, I love your personality. Are you working right now? And I'm still in school. I have one semester left. And he offered me a job right there and then. And that's how I started. So I love you guys. You boosted my career. And I was always so involved. I loved how food grads did everything so beautifully. And they managed students so well. You... I attended like almost everything and I've worked with you a lot too, Veronica. Yeah, I know. It's exciting. I know we, did, we didn't talk for a little bit in between, you know, how yeah. when people graduate, like so many things and like I went into my own career and all that type of stuff. But I did, I had no idea that um, about finding the role. How did I not know that? <laughs> I guess it was, it was a hit or miss. And honestly, that's how I started it. So there was a guy who was named Mike and was like I like you as a QA you look so good you have all the understanding from the school and I want to hire you and yeah I worked with CFI because of my co-ops I worked at so many places and then I switched so many companies because I wanted to learn every aspect of food industry I was mm -hmm. never never that person who wants to learn everything mm -hmm. I still want to learn so much about seafood like it's Sometimes it's overwhelming because it's completely different from meat industry. But I still love it. I love every single day of it. Now I know there are sea scallops and bay scallops and Peruvian scallops. I thought scallops are scallops. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your career journey and how it's led you to working at Toppets today. So 
it's a long long haul so guys be prepared so first of all i started my bachelor's in india i did my bachelor's in food microbiology and biotechnology in india as my majors i came here i started with a bridging course with uft and centennial where i did both so in centennial i studied as my major was biotechnology and then i took some courses of health and health sci and food sci in uft while i was doing my course i landed in great co-op places like my first co-op was centennial itself so i was already a tutor at centennial and i was a ta tutor in centennial teaching students chemistry because chemistry was something i really loved and i love the math and chemistry and two of them was really great together for me so i started with analytical chemistry as a ta and then i got a position as a lab technician at centennial where i was full time lab technician for four months for my first co-op from my first co-op i landed on my second co-op which was at cfi i worked there as a media prep and microbiologist i was there full time for again my second co-op and it was prolonged for 6 months because somebody was laid off and i was just covering until the new person was hired for that position and then moving forward from there i started working at wg so in between working between wg and centennial or whatever in my free time my summer job was actually working as a lab tech for a water park that was fun too wow that's so cool <laughs> yeah i was handling chemistry there and somehow destiny has always brought me back to the lab <laughs> lab i'm a big 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 lab rat somehow i always end up in a lab even though i try my best not to i want to talk to people sometimes and nope you are destined to be in a lab so yeah it brings me back to the lab and then i started my first job full time job in wg it's a very small co-packing company but because i had from my bachelor's in india i had some experience there but i had nothing when i came here in field except my co-ops and my side jobs so i decided let's just jump in and while working and i landed this wg job from food grads i was on a event a guy found me and i got recruited on the spot all i had to do was go back use his name and sit in the interview and somehow they liked me and they i got hired so i was working as a qa technician there i was on floor 99% of the time 1% was the desk work i only used to go on the desk when i had to go for like lunch or printing labels basically i had no computer jobs all i was doing was hard work manual labor where i was like looking at all the lines checking all the labels printing out all the labels seeing all the small details not in depth but just working in the in the fact and then moving forward from there i worked there i developed most of the cfi requirements and regulations because of cfi i i did a lot of courses when i was in cfi in my co-op so uh all my regulations and my foundations were pretty strong because of working at cfi cfi was a great workplace where they actually give students a chance to take courses on their websites i never knew cfi had that option but whoever is cfi is employee you are allowed to take as many as courses as possible and luckily i took in that four months i did almost 80% of all the courses that was available for mm. sf cr sqf yeah. hsf everything wow and so i have a bundle of certificates of courses from cfi wow and that would be the perfect place because you know i mean this is canadian regulations this isn't that these are very broad and these are certifications that can be applied to throughout the entire industry so they they you got some street cred basically from that <laughs> exactly my street cred was amazing and i knew the regulations more than anything else yeah. i was always dealing with the knowledge that cfi yeah. gave me the smallest task even filling a petri plate 
I was taught all of that, filling petri plates and every small detail CFI taught me, even how to calibrate a weighing machine. Usually your workplace doesn't teach you how to calibrate it, but CFI did teach me that. Oh, this is how you calibrate it. Okay. I usually, for now, all my workplaces, when people are, oh, you know how to calibrate a thermometer and a weighing scale? That's cool. You know wow. how to do a pipe fit calibration? Oh, I don't know that. Because in school, they never teach you how to calibrate it. They do teach you how to use it, but nobody knows how to calibrate it. Yeah, usually it's the laboratory technicians that are actually at your school that usually would do those calibrations so you wouldn't have a need to do something like that. Yeah, and when you go to workplace and if you are the only technician in the room and something goes wrong, the, the weights do not match up and the product is running on the line, then you would never think that something is wrong with the scale, but you would think something is your first lookout is something is wrong with the product. It's a really good, interesting thing to think about because we just assume that again, it would be the products because that's the first thing you would assume you, yeah. you would be like, you my, my scale's not wrong in the calibration. Exactly. So like I've landed in, in those where I worked at several companies. I, I, would not name all of them, but I've worked with a few mm -hmm. and I've worked with major companies like Sofina, which is a meat plant industry. I worked there for a year and a half. I was a QA technician there again. I was hired as a QA technician, advanced in my career there, advanced in the job posting there. I learned a lot from there and I basically used to work for afternoon shifts. So afternoon shifts are usually independent working rather than working with the managers or anybody because manager hours, they end at four or five. After mm -hmm. that, you are on your own. Yeah. I had the same experience when I was working at the peanut company, when I did the alternating shifts, the managers would work in the, in the daytime because it was a small facility. So it's definitely a different experience, even though you, of course your manager is like a call away yes. um, being on your own. It has this like pseudo independence that's it, it'll get exactly. you growing fast in terms of, of personality and what you can handle. Yeah, exactly. So somehow I always got that afternoon shifts. I always was in afternoon shift for WG. I was always in afternoon for wet and while I was on my own. Even at Sofina, I was on my own dealing with things. I was working in ready to eat and we had a huge, huge facility and it's one of the complex facilities that Sofina says it's one of the complex one because it has both raw and ready to eat products in it. Everything is made there. Everything is produced. Raw mat comes in. So raw material would come in from different facilities and it gets molded in, made in the raw section. And then it gets cooked there because of the whole process and it gets sliced there. And then it is turned into RTE, it's ready to eat, and it's out in the product from our facility itself. Okay. So I guess that was the last step before you ended up in where you are right now, which is Toppets, I understand. So you work in QA and you're a HACCP coordinator as well? Yes. With Toppets, it's different. Like I have so many hats to wear with Toppets because... With Sofina, it was such a huge company. So we had a huge QA team of, I think, 10 or 12 people in two shifts. Adding all the shifts, it was, wow. it, it was 10. Yeah, it was 10 people. One was handling chemistry. One was the microbiologist. We had a micro lab inside too, which was interesting. I never saw that. I learned a lot from Sofina. I had so much hands-on training. I could not ask for more. And... QA, the best, best experience is to learn from mistakes. Okay. So the more mistakes there are, you have to solve it somehow because that's the, you are the fire brigade. I see myself as that person who has to think always out of the box to solve problems. Basically, I'm a problem solver 24 seven, my brain rack. How do I solve it? Is it dead? Is it glazed? Not glazed? There are so many questions that goes on. Let's actually dive into that because you're saying that is a skill that I know is very important in the industry, especially when you're dealing with quality and problem solving, I know is something that it gets better over time when you have the experience, but 
How, how do you approach problems, for example, if there was an issue in the plant, let's say with your position that you have right now, how do you go about solving problems? What's kind of the steps that you go through in your head? So the first step is always, if you see a problem, they will reach out to you. And most of the time, it's QA, because QA is dealing with so many regulations and SOPs, it's QA sometimes who will miss out on certain points. Let's say the weighing scale that was on the line. I'm just giving an example. Okay. It was not teared. It is not teared and the product is going through. The weight is too high, so they are adjusting to the weight. But the weighing scale is not teared. So the final product which goes through the end of the line is actually underweight. So the box weight is already added, but technically it is supposed to be net weight. The product itself is the net weight. So those things and QA misses it out. And the first thing is I always believe in accountability. If you made a boo-boo, you go ahead and say, yes, I did that. Okay. Somewhere in my checks, this was missed. And now I have to somehow solve it. So first of all, take accountability of the problem. Make sure that you go and apologize to all the people. And then you, whenever you go to any problems, my first motto is don't bring a problem to someone, bring a solution with it. So I always rack my brain with five different solutions. Okay, what can I do to handle it? Is repacking a good idea? Is it too much money? Can I do something with the lot? Can we sell it at number two? Is there something that I can do? Is there are so many things that can be done. So all the costs, you have to go through all the steps. Go through the SOP. I always go through the SOP again. You have already taken the accountability. You are trying to figure out the solution. The solution is always in the SOP because the person who makes the product is very distinct in his mind or her mind. So whenever QAs or R&D or anybody who is like developing the program or SOPs, which I do for topics, I go through each and every step of it. Okay, this much is the glaze. This is without glaze. This is how the product should look. This is rejected. This is accepted. All of that. So I go through all the steps. I have already taken accountability. I'm reiterating. So sorry. I'm going through accountability. I read the SOPs. I think about the solutions. I bring the solutions to my manager or somebody who can help me. Like right now, I have, my manager is new. So I always ask people who have worked in the, in the industry right now. There are somebody who's worked in the seafood industry for 15 years. How did they deal with the same issue in the past? Because problems are not different, but solutions can be different. So how did they deal with that issue? And if I like the way they dealt with the issue, I select that as my solution. If not, I would always go to my manager, say, show my solutions. We work on the solutions. If something needs to be added, we add it. And then finally, we just solve the solution in the end. So that's how I work all upon interpersonal skills at the end. How many solutions can you bring out? And that comes through. I think most of them comes with experience. The more problems you see, the more solutions you see. I love your philosophy with all this, Fatima. That one key line that you said, don't just bring problems, bring solutions with them. I think that's such a key thing. And I feel like I almost want to steal that if I was going to an interview, that, that would be like an answer for, because that's the thing that pops up in my mind, because that's what employers want to see. They want to see solutions because at the end of the day, one solution might not fit all. And like you said before, I like that you pointed out that you can have the same problem, but there can be multiple different solutions to it. And it might a solution in the past might have worked then. You might need a new solution for today, even though it's the same problem. So I really like how you've just developed this mindset. And it's you're definitely well suited for QA based on what I'm hearing. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like, I love, I love what I do. Like, I honestly, I, I love every second of it. Sometimes it does get overwhelming when you have audits going on and on the side, you have SFCR testing going on and you are like dealing with all the imports, exports because of topics is something who deals with a lot of imports. I'm responsible for imports too. 
because QA is like a threshold for any company. We are the threshold. If anything passes through us, we are either saving the company or we can jeopardize the company with one yes or one no. Wow. So it really sounds though QA it's just an important job that really can make or break a company if you have good or bad quality standards. Exactly. You can have bad quality at the end, but then the product would go on the market and sit for years because nobody would buy that bad quality product. <laughs> exactly. And if the QA and QC, if they're not catching it, well, that could honestly tank a company. Exactly. One of the things that you have mentioned that you've worked on the CFIA and as well working at Toppets with imports and exports, I was just curious about how you learn about regulations because I know that different countries have different regulations and to someone on the outside, it just feels like this huge long list of like things and it could get pretty dry. So how have you even started to learn about what's correct and what's not correct in terms of regulations? So every Every country has their own body, CFI, US, so for us, it's CFI, USDA is for USA, SFCR, or let's, let's say SQFI, which, which is like a third party, which is a standard, which is supposed to be good for all. And most of the reputed companies have them. BRC, there's BRC. BRC is known worldwide, all my all our suppliers we deal with either have some kind of BRC or SQF certifications, which are resonating to CFI certifications, but some of the rules and regulations are different. And on the side, before going, before even learning, I always like to study the regulation manual, which is always available on the website for BRC, SQF, gluten-free, all these are available on the website. You just open the website of BRC, you'll find the manual. Open SQF, you find the manual. And you know that what is required. And most of the companies would know, like, what do I require in order to pass? And we would collect all the certifications. And that's how a new supplier is chosen for certain species. And certain species are not even allowed in Canada. So we go through airs. You can search up the species, what species are technically allowed in Canada. And the website of CFI is very important because it, they will show you how much percentage of additives are allowed, chemicals are allowed, any food colorings, any name, anything, even salt. Like I'm like, there is three kinds of salts that go into like sodium phosphate, sodium tripolyphosphate. It's a long list. Well, I guess it's a good thing to know that our government is actually has regulations that we're not just throwing anything we feel like in our food. So I guess that is a, oh, it is a good thing about that. But I guess that'd be a really good idea if a student wanted to just, you know, in their spare time, if they wanted to just get accustomed to knowing what a QA looks at and is understanding. I mean, the CFIA, I'm assuming their website is just all these regulations you can just look up. You don't I, need like a special membership or anything, right? We don't. I okay. honestly follow everything step by step. I have the website open and when I'm doing my micro testing, I see it. Even sample collection seems very easy, right? We are, I think everybody when take. I remember when I took biochemistry, we were taught like how to allot samples or how samplings occur or random samplings in food micro. That was one of the subjects I remembered, food micro, how does CFI collect sample and how do you collect samples? And at that time you were studying in the books or in a lecture about sampling and suddenly you are doing it, right? <laughs> oh, that's so, the best feeling when you start to actually apply what you've done in school to the world, like the workplace. It's It, it makes it feel like what you did for however many years worth it. Yeah, definitely. And I would I would highly recommend anyone who who is thinking oh food is not a growing than pharma definitely pharma is more precise whereas food is not lenient as well people think that pharma follows all the regulations to the t that's that's completely correct but at the same time medicine is aseptic so you deal with a lot less bacteria, whereas with food, you can end up with everything. 
Uh, so. That's something I never even considered as well. I mean, I in the back of my mind, that makes, I know that, but with food safety, it's not only are you dealing with like physical hazards, like metals or plastics that can go in your food, but then you also got to do deal with microbes and all that. And I could imagine, especially with fish that could like dealing with raw meats and all that, that would even be harder than something like maybe like a vegetable or something, because you could exactly. bring in, you could bring in a lot. So, um, yeah. so, so actually that, that's a good blend to where I wanted to ask a question about, um, what type of things do you look for in food safety in regards to the fishing industry or in, in what you do? What are, what are the, some of the so, things that you say is like good to pass or something? So it, I'll start with meat and industry because that's my foundation at Sofina. So because I belong to, I worked in seafood industry for a year, but meat I've known for quite a while. So I can definitely speak for it. And the first thing you see is the texture. Physical attributes play a major role. Holes or any physical problems while you see the product, it looks green in color. It smells awful. Right off the bat, you reject it. Then once you have already rejected it physically, then you go towards the chemical. Is something while running on the line? Is there any hazards that you see? If you hear anything, most of the time, somebody will hear on the line, oh, I heard a metal pin go through. Now we have to saw through all of this, whatever is packed has to go through all of the metal detection. So metal detection is something you see very, very much and very deeply into and follow the wands to the T, always follow, do your metal checks. That's something that can give people, people can choke on metal if even it is the tiniest amount or somebody has allergy to metal, that's worse, they might ingest it. So always look at the metal, then going forward, other comes micro testing. So with RTE, ready to eat, it's always salmonella and listeria. Listeria comes in cooked products. So you will see a lot of listeria buildup if the manufacturing company is actually slicing and packing the product or manufacturing the product. Whereas in raw, the chances of the tolerance is higher because the product is still going to be cooked. So you are more relaxed in terms of following the regulations. So it's now coming back to topics. There are some products which are RTE, but we only deal, our major products are all raw. We deal with a lot of raw products and yeah, that's about it. So our regulations are different, but yeah, it goes through microbial testing. And again, you can just go to CFI website and look through all of the testing that are required. They will show you how to do standard testing. So I do, whenever I prepare a report for a new product that is imported from a different company, let's say Vietnam, I look for product, is it appearing good? For example, let's take shrimp. Shrimp, does it look good? Are the veins pull out? Is it big enough? Is it curling? Is it matching all the specs? Does it have any weird random spots going from there? Are the master case labeled? The inner cases labeled? Are they matching the product? What is packed inside? Is the glaze matching every small detail? Then moving forward, some of the product, how depends upon the lot size. Depending upon the lot size, which is shown on CFI website, you can collect the sampling size. And from that sampling size, it goes for microbial testing. And then I do a lot of phosphate, sulfites, micro drug testing because drug is major, major thing in seafood. Some of the products are supposed to be drug free. All of the products mostly are supposed to be drug free, but there is a tolerance for some of them for mercury. Fish has a higher content of mercury, which is allowed, whereas other products are, no, no, you can't have any mercury. So right. yeah, that's about it. Well, you say that's about it, but that's a lot of stuff that goes into it, which I'm happy to hear, mind you. I mean, that's a good thing yeah. that we're doing all these regulations. But in the end, why did you decide to go into the food industry? What, what drew you towards it? Honestly, I was clueless as a duck. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing with my life. 
in my mind i was like yeah my life is going to be working in the lab that's all my first co-op was working at centennial as a lab technician all i did was made chemicals taught students so yeah this is my life i'm going to teach students i'm going to be a lab technician and this makes me happy it was a very chill job because it's a co-op and your responsive the level of responsibility is so low and accountability again it's so low but at the same time yes there is a lot of responsibility and accounting ability in that job but still you are treated as a student too because you are working at the school while studying so i was in my mind a free bird and as soon as i i went to cfi i saw the atmosphere i knew like I, somehow i knew i'm i'm going to be in food industry and yes someday i'll be on the top maybe <laughs> Well, if you keep up with the trajectory you're going, I could definitely see that happening. So it really does sound, though, that it was just finding the right co-op position. And it, it, is that not how it kind of just started? Yeah, definitely. Somehow I chose and dealt with all the right cards at the right time. It really shows that how important it is to do co-op and you never, it, it's always worth it to just give it a shot. And I mean, the worst that could have happened was like in this position, you knew you liked the lab, but then it, at least with Centennial, but just going for CFI, CFIA, had you never decided, oh, I'm just going to give it a shot, you would have never fallen in love with the food industry. Exactly. And I knew I was a lab rat for the longest time, but I never knew that I can use my ratiness in in QA, they need this. I, I was always this creative person who wanted to always think outside the box. And somehow it was QA become, became that thing where I could use both. I could love what I'm doing right now. Like tomorrow I would have to do, I know for sure, I have to prepare three more reports. And a lot of things are happening today. The sample collection, I will be doing that. But at the same time, I will be dealing with problems, customer complaints. I love talking to customers and talking about our products. I love, Topics has helped me a lot in terms of my interpersonal relations. They actually, because it's a small company, and in my experience, you learn a lot more in a smaller company rather than a bigger company. Because in a bigger company, there are so many people involved for so many tasks, so you have lesser tasks. But in a smaller company, because there are not so many people involved. So somehow you deal with everything. Everything is your problem and everything is your solution. Again, it's great that you have this attitude because for some people, QA can be because the job is essentially solving problems. That can be very challenging for some people because it's, I mean, of course you want those days where everything goes well because, you know, at the end of the day, that's what QA like strives for. But yeah. QA is solving problems and to have that attitude, you need that mentality going into it. Like you can't avoid exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. If you are thinking like this is an idealistic world where nothing is going to be go wrong and everything is going to be a smooth sailing boat. You go there, you watch everything, do your check. Everything was okay. You come back to your desk, do your, verify your checks and yeah, boom, you're done. No, 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 no. That one <laughs> check, you enter the facility. Okay. I see hundreds of problems, especially during audit. It's like a cutthroat situation where suddenly all the small, tiny details that you neglect on daily basis, like condensation, becomes a huge problem. Like, oh, there is condensation. Somehow you have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, audits are arguably one of the one of the most difficult things when working in QA and preparing them because it's, of course, you want to be audit ready every single day of the year, but th there's a lot to do to get to that point and you have to constantly be on top of it. And sometimes when you have a line problem, the day-to-day, -day, those day-to-day -day things can, can overlook some of those really small, minute details that they, audits are hard. <laughs> they are hard and they're stressful. Yeah, if any QA I will ask and if they have gone through audits, yes, that mm -hmm. would be the answer. But at the same time, they are fun. After yeah. a while, once they are done, how relieved are you? Like suddenly there's this 
massive massive weight on your head which you are carrying every day to work okay now i have to answer 500 questions it's worse than an exam because a year's worth of work is crunched up in three days three days yeah. of your life in, yeah and you have to answer every answer correctly that's another situation like you cannot be wrong because if you are wrong then you are jeopardizing company's reputation basically oh my gosh yes and doing doing those audits there's just so much to it but you're right once you get through it and when you get that passing grade that you guys know that you deserve it's it's one of like the best feelings that you could ever have in the workplace just knowing that you're whatever auditing body just came through and you passed through it it's it just feels so worth it exactly yeah. and mm -hmm. audit will teach you everything once you go through the process you will know the nicks nooks and crannies of a place because it will go through sop so deeply word to word line to line full stop to full stop if it is two to three ounce and your product is weighing 2.5 and ounce to three ounce you are in trouble you are in big trouble buddy <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure because we're coming close to the end of our mm -hmm. conversation there was a few things that i just wanted to ask you before i let you go and although we've touched upon this i wanted to know directly why is the food industry a great place to work the best thing is the joy i see every time is looking at your products on the newspaper flyers don't you feel like once you are looking at the flyer and suddenly you see top it's and you are like oh this is my product this is my baby it's <laughs> it's being sold to no frills and blah blahs and long goes and i go there and i'm so happy to look it on the shelves and people are taking it and people are buying it oh my product is sold out wow so yeah that's one of the reasons i can say why i was so into food industry and i would never leave it because of that contentment that you see on people's face I love that answer. I do. It's there. I, I'm totally on the same level with you. When I used to, when I was working at these companies and I went to the grocery store and I saw that product on the shelf and I was like, and I would look at the lock code and then be like, oh, it was from this day. Oh, it was these people working. And oh, I remember doing this. And you just feel so proud because you know that you were part of this collective that got this product out. And especially seeing it sold out, and pe seeing people love what you're doing or see not know the behind the scenes, but love that final product. Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. So that is such a good answer. <laughs> yeah, so that's something like I wake up to. Honestly, that's what I wake up to. The joy I see in like, I see in myself, like every time I get a, I have a habit of like casually reading. Like I would read anything and everything. Like my brain doesn't stop. I have this problem. I <laughs> have to constantly do something. Either I'm doing something with my hands. If I'm not doing something with my hands, I'm on my phone. If I'm not on my phone, I'm reading a book. If I'm not reading a book, so while eating, we place papers underneath so we can, whenever we drop curry, the dining table doesn't get dirty. So on that paper, I see my, the pamphlet that is dropped off these are my products. Okay. Let's read through. Let's skim through all the products. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is what I worked on. This is what I agreed on. This is as fast. Oh, this is already on the shelf. I was still working on a project and oh, this passed. They approved it. Oh, that's cool. I love that. That's such a good answer. I think this would also be a good time to ask this, hearing from your enthusiasm and as someone who loves this industry, what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career that's similar to yours? First of all, I would highly, highly recommend just get into the industry. Don't think any job is small or big or it's not on your level. If you are just doing some minor things, you are even working on the line, but that gives you so much power and so much knowledge. Once you are in the industry, you will grow like definitely QA is something 
that your brain will keep on growing. And if you are not happy with the company, just switch to a company where you think you will be happy. Switch industries, how I did. I was not happy with meat industry at the end. So I switched to seafood. Don't give up and be accountable. That's the major, major thing. Whatever you do in your life, always be accountable. And problem solving is something, if you like to solve problems, if you like to do puzzles every day, this is this is the field for you. Like you will have problems every day. QA is about problem solving and how to solve it efficiently. Everybody can solve problems, but how can you do it better? I love that. And I'm going to leave it there because you said it perfectly. So last question I'm going to ask, where can people find you? Oh, I am on Instagram. I am on LinkedIn. I am on Facebook and I actually help out Centennial and UFT. And I mentor students if they ever want to come to me and just learn about the field. I'm always happy to help. I am always on food grads. So you guys can always see me there too. Veronica would be more than happy to bring out the question. I would take that. If you guys have any more questions, you should definitely reach out. I'll make sure to leave all of the information that Fatima just said in the show notes for this episode. And with that, I'll thank you so much, Fatima, for coming on the show. This was, this hour just flew by. I don't even know how it's been an hour, but I love see, catching up with you and seeing where the world has take you, taken you since you've been a campus ambassador. But I'm excited because I know we're going to get you back involved. I'm, I, I, we've had some discussions that you guys might hear another voice on the podcast. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, definitely. Like I am always more than excited to work with food grads. That's where I started my career. So I would always love to come back and give back to students like me. So once again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. That was episode 17 of the Food Grads podcast. Did you enjoy hearing Fatima's voice on the podcast? Well, stay tuned. You'll be hearing more from her as Fatima is going to be a host in the show in some future episodes. So stay tuned for that. All the notes for this podcast can be found on the Food Grads website by clicking the podcast tab on the homepage. There you can find any notes for this episode on past or future episodes as well. Just before I go, if you are a youth, new entrant, or student in Ontario and are considering a career in agriculture, food, or the beverage industries, then you should check out the Feeding Your Future initiative. On March 11th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, they are hosting a virtual career fair in partnership with food grads to connect students with local agri-food employers and job seekers across the province. During the fair, you can connect with other job seekers in your area, gain professional contacts, have one-on-one -on -one conversations with employers and industry experts, all from the comfort of your own home. If you're interested, then check out Food Grads social feeds or Feeding Your Future initial of social feeds and you can find more information on to sign up. I'm excited to talk about this because you're going to hear in a future episode one of the people who are involved in that initiative. So I'll be excited to share more about that and how you can get involved. That's it for this week's podcast. Thank you everyone so much for listening. I'll see you next week. Music